Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We're getting towards the end of the day. Thank you for uh, bearing with us. It's an absolute tremendous <coughs> privilege to introduce Derek Robertson to you. I had a, I had a great honour of working with Derek at uh, Learning Teach in Scotland uh, a number of years ago. Fantastic opportunity in my career and uh, fantastic to work with him. Um, he's got some great work to share with you today um, about that he's been working on mind, uh, Minecraft and I'm just going to pass over to him. Thank you Derek. Thank you Charlie, thank you very much. Great to see so many of you interested in what we've been doing folks on a, a wet Saturday afternoon. Uh, Minecraft on the waterfront, it was where letters are contenders. I don't know if anyone remembers that Marlon Brando movie. You've seen that on the waterfront, you know, could have been a contender. Uh, to some extent, I feel that about my own career to some extent, but also I do think that uh, learners are coming to school and I think things are changing for them in terms of the landscape and how they learn. And I think digital culture has a huge impact on that. So I think we need to understand how we are contenders more than we understand when they're not in school. So I'm going to talk to you today a bit about how we've used Minecraft with primary school people to allow them to, to digitally reimagine. Uh, redesign and then rebuild the Dundee waterfront. If you've been to Dundee today, you'll see the waterfronts in the state of, of redesign. The DNA is coming here. It's a fantastic thing for the city. Absolute brilliant news for our city and the surrounding area. So we put this into a context for learning uh, along the lines of the ideal idea from CX. <coughs> so I'm going to talk to you about that, folks, okay? It tells a bit about my background. Uh, I was a primary school teacher for a number of years, and uh, something happened to me when I saw kids playing a Super Nintendo one day on the last day of term before Christmas. Two boys playing a, a game. Remember the Nintendo? Sorry, the Super Nintendo. Do you remember that console? Super Nintendo. A lot of people. Street Fighter in particular. For those of you who played that. <laughs> yeah, yeah some of you are fantastic game. Chun Li was my favourite. But anyway, they played a game that involved the, the, the manipulation of a range of 2D shapes and sequences and patterns. They got faster and faster and faster. And I, I had no idea what was going on. So I'm sitting watching this. What is going on here? The two boys that were playing this were my lowest ability group for maths, and I lazily thought that the fault was with them. They weren't bright, they weren't clever. But then a wee bit of a kind of a serendipitous eye opener. What's going on here? This, look how able they are. Look how they're using the problem solving skills. Anyway, I got interested in computer games for learning, and it wasn't a bustling's hall because I wasn't a gamer. And I had the real uh, privilege of getting appointed to lead games based learning at national level in 2006. This gentleman here, Lloyd O'Donnell, uh, had the vision <coughs> to do this. And we then put out ideas which really seemed to resonate with the primary teacher. We put Nintendo DS into school, we put uh, Xbox, 360, PlayStation, Nintendo Wii. And just at the time where games consoles were coming out of bedrooms into the living room, you know, when it was made for games for families, uncles and aunties, grandkids and granddads. And our thinking was that it was all based on this idea of what they call semiotic domains, where children situate themselves in a domain where they have the status, mastery, expertise, experience... And if you situate learning in context such as that, uh, learning context allows you to be able to address learning in a way in which children respond to very positively. As opposed to school being the domain where the teacher is the one with the status, experience, uh, mastery, all these things. So we put Dr. Kawashima's brain training into school and our research showed impact on, on mental arithmetic. Uh, we put Nintendogs into primary one and with fantastic impact, all published research folks that came from our work, so it's not just me talking, yeah, this is what we did, we published research to support this. I put Guitar Hero into schools in 2007, 2008. Laurie said, are you going to use that in school? Just watch. <laughs> so we put that into school. My colleague Ollie Bray took that to East Lothian and they won the European Innovation Prize in Microsoft. I went to Australia and the Victorian state government copied, not copied, they replicated what we were doing in Scotland <laughs> with Guitar Hero. So a lot of the kind of really innovative stuff happened and then I had the pleasure of bringing Charlie Love on board, uh, Brian Clark, who led our games design stuff from 2009 onwards. We had a national games design competition in 2010 at the Scottish Learning Festival. Fantastic momentum gathering. Uh, we were invited down to speak to the Hope Livingston Review team uh, in London to inform them about what we were doing in Scotland. And the interesting thing is, when Education Scotland was formed, all that was kind of like erased. I'm not bitter, folks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that happened. Right, that happened. And uh, I'm really disappointed about that. Uh, but anyway, things move on. Uh, you won't find any traces on the website either, folks. So it's, it's like... Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> the power of cultural domains, folks. Stanley Longnose has come to Dundee to deliver the uh, uh, Royal Society of Edinburgh's Christmas lecture. Come to Care Hall in Dundee. Look at the queue for tickets. 
The, the queues are way up the streets in Dundee. People want to come along to see Stanley Longwood do the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And I think something's really interesting here. Cultural domains, culture, behaviours and attitudes should be the heart of all we should be thinking about in terms of learning in schools. It's really, really important that we do that. And when I was an undergraduate student back in 94, I was doing a thesis about autonomy in schools in Denmark and Scotland. I got to do a placement in Denmark. One of the, the, uh, uh, the quotations that stayed with me from the de-schoolers, from people like John Holt and Ivan Illich and A.S. Neil from Scotland and Eric McKenzie from Scotland, was that quotation there, that school prepares for the alienating institutionalisation of life by teaching the need to be taught. That school fills the role that it teaches kids that they've got to be taught. Now, when I was reading the DigiLearn Scott uh, report, one of the things that jumped out at me, which I think needs to be challenged, is this uh, opening quotation here, <coughs> that excellent teaching is the heart of improving outcomes for learners. Digital technology can support us, but it can't replace it. In order to unlock the full potential of digital technology to enrich learning in Scotland schools, it is vital to ensure that the teaching profession has the skills and confidence to use digital tools. Now, folks, I don't agree with that. And the, when I think the landscape's changed, and I really think that, I think that's a fixed perspective. If we're going to make any progress, we need to understand the landscape has changed. Do our children need to be taught all the time? What's happening in digital spaces where they choose to situate themselves, where they are attaining heights, the likes of which their teachers don't even know that they're doing? And the research project I'm going to tell you about, 13 children I spoke to all have their own YouTube channels, where they've got their capture cards hooked up to their games consoles, hooked up to their, their laptops, and they're editing their own tutorial videos, and they are intrinsically motivated to embed themselves in this wider learning culture that's out with school. None of the teachers knew about it. Now you think about that, children intrinsically motivated to learn and be part of that learning culture. I think that's why we need to question this assumption that teaching is the heart of everything. Great teachers do great things and we need to teach, obviously, but I think we need to ensure that context happens in schools where we can allow learners to lead as well. Folks, a vision of the not so very distant future for learning. I saw, so I won't name the, the person, I've got a problem with the video streaming through, it should come through, here we go, right? Let's have you look at this video, okay? And how we think about it. This is the vision of the future in schools <coughs> using new technologies. So go and jump to it. Go on, go and jump to it. Seeming through. Jumping on here, here we go, right? Watch them when they get to school. What do you think of this as a vision of future technologies and learning? Once they get out of the car. Barcelona at a conference, and the person presenting at ICT uh, was basically saying, this is, this is wonderful. What do you think? but with the new shiny, shiny tech that's going to cost us X quillions and quid to buy. You know, so what's changing there? So this is the kind of thing I think we need to be careful of, folks. And this is all kind of embedded in what I'm talking about as well, right? That as teachers, I think we need to be careful that we don't enslave these fantastic digital technologies into the traditional methods that were maybe always used. We need to be really critical about how we use things so we can affect this culture change that I'm talking about. Now, and that basically what I'm saying is how can informed engagement with digital tools and digital culture help us further understand learning, how can this enable us to deliver better outcomes for learners? Because that's what I'm about, basically. How do we enable better outcomes for learners in our schools? I went to, when I was, I visited some Malta, and I took them to uh, one of my colleagues, uh, local authorities in Scotland, to see what they were doing with iPads. And we went to this school where, apparently, there was really good practice with iPads happening. And I said to the kids, go show me what you're doing. 
And uh, she's what kind of arts have you got? She's oh, the teacher lets us use things for arts that are educational. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? She said, well, we've got to do, we've got spelling arts, we've got punctuation arts, and we've got, um, we've got maths arts. And so I said to them, what about, have you got video star? Uh, have you seen video star? Yeah. You know video star, right? You, there's kids all over the globe using video star to make their own wonderfully created animations of their favourite songs. They put them on YouTube and they're getting thousands and thousands and thousands of hits. And I said, have you got video star? No, Mr. Robertson, no, no, that's, that's not educational. That's not educational. <laughs> and I said to them, wait, have you got Minecraft? Have you got Minecraft? <laughs> well, Mr. Robertson, no, 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 that's not, that's not educational. <laughs> I said, not educational. So I said, wait a minute. And I look at some of the worlds that are getting built by young learners and how fantastically, mind-blowingly brilliant they are when you look at what they build. And when you see the skill set required to do that, the behaviours that they exhibit in order to get to these levels, but also the intrinsic motivation to self-improve. I think these are all things we've all heard before with CFE, and it seems to be happening in children's own spaces out with schools. It's happening in schools as well, don't get me wrong, I'm not griping about schools completely, just some aspects of how we can approach digital tech. The Kelpies there, folks, somebody built a guitar in Minecraft that you can play. It's a big plectrum, by the way, but... uh, (laughs) Okay, so this developing culture outside of school and skill based on our learners that flames this intrinsic motivation to enable survival in and mastery of this complex digital world. How many of you play Minecraft? Put your hands up. How many of you play in survival mode? Right? It's tough, isn't it? You see, once you get started, your first night in survival, you've got to learn how to build a house. It's tough. And then you've got to mine and map your way, so it's, you know yourself, it's, it's, it's a really complex world. So, what happened was, I, when I was at uh, Education Scotland, we were looking for different ways in which we could explore this, and I uh, f- uh, stumbled across a guy called Dean Groom from the States, uh, from Australia, sorry, Dean Groom, and uh, Joe Kay, I only know Joe Kay's Twitter name, sorry Joe Kay, and Bron Stuckey, and they were running the massively Minecraft servers, and they were doing the most amazing things with kids out with school where they were building these amazing worlds and teaching about how to code in Minecraft, etc., in this space. They built all the districts on the Hunger Games, you know, as they were in tremendous stuff. And so we had a teach meet here about was it three, four years ago. <coughs> Dean came over to visit me, and we held a teach meet here, and we were, the idea we were going to do a Minecraft thing. Uh, I just didn't go off the ground. But anyway, as I was formulating these ideas about Minecraft, the Dundee Waterfront thing was happening, okay? And here's Dundee Waterfront built in Minecraft. Go on, stream through. Here we go, folks. This is, this is how it's going to look. So the plans that are there already, this is how they're going to look, right? So the folks at 4J Studio built, there's the new v Museum. And I was already thinking this idea about a fantastic local context with an ideal framework for kids in Dundee to be able to engage with. And so here we are, look, all in Minecraft. And this is a space that our children know, our learners know. Okay? I won't play the whole thing, folks. So that made me think, you know, what we're going to do here. So I, uh, I approached the City Council, and I spoke to Kenny McCune and Shona McKnight, fantastic colleagues, really open-minded, really keen to see how this could also link to the work and looking at what the Wood Report said about employability. So we formed together this idea of a, of a project, and I managed to, to loan 25 Xboxes and PSCs from what was the old Consolarium CPD cover. I used to manage this in Globe, where all the, the assets that we had gathered over the years were available for loan to Scottish teachers. And you, you, you went and logged into Globe and you booked it, and we delivered it to your school, and we could it back. And all, only, all you had to do was write a report on our wiki about how you used it. Uh, so, uh, as Don, Don Adams uh, kindly organised that for me. Thank you, Don, at, Edu- at Education Scotland. I updated them all, 25 costs, it took me about a week and a half to update them and to put uh, Minecraft on them, and I got a lot of licenses for free from 4G Studios, thank you to 4G Studios. I bought a number of controllers from a funding from Chetcher, which is a Dundee University organisation, so I got funding to do it. We put out a call of interest to Dundee Primary Schools. We were oversubscribed, oversubscribed by six. There was a huge demand for it from Dundee Schools, which I think is fantastic to see. For the schools that were selected, we had a teacher information night, not a training night, because my thesis was... Your children will be experts. What you should be doing in Minecraft, what you should be doing is using your teaching expertise to be able to do the teaching aspects of the challenge of the design brief, which I'll explain. And my daughter came along with me that night, and she basically was showing all how to do stuff on the screen. 
right? She was my expert. Her teacher was in the, the group as well. It was great for her to kind of role reversal. My colleague from town planning, Deepak Gopinath, was with me, and because this is us working together to see how town planning can even be embedded in the challenge, so it gets IDL going beyond subject boundaries. And uh, I went out and helped them set up the consoles and let the schools get on them. I mean, the learners group in GLOW, which is one of the busiest GLOW groups I've ever seen, it was battered with children chatting to each other and showing pictures that they made in their Minecraft worlds. Very, very simple group, just getting them to chat. What was the brief, folks? Let me just see if I can go to the brief. Uh, quickly show you that. I'm already, I'm already, yeah, you're already. fine. I'm fine. Yeah, you've got 15 minutes. Right, so the brief, folks, uh, was basically down here, uh, they had to reimagine, redesign, and then rebuild Dundee Waterfront, as they think it would, uh, as it would be. And they had to consider the aesthetic of their design, how the design will make it an enjoyable city space to be in, how can tourism be attracted and supported to the city of Dundee, uh, what about local amenity enhancement for the people in Dundee? And what about employment opportunities? <coughs> so the children were given that design brief, and off they went and had to think about it. Okay? What did they think? Well, here's some... Folks, I'm trolling through all the research data at the moment, so I'm going to throw some things at you. I've got ten hours of audio interviews. To trans I've transcribed them now. I'm putting them in a thing called NVivo. It allows me to do a, a, a data analysis. So I'm going through that and pulling out all the themes at the minute. But I also did a questionnaire, so I'm going to share some of that information with you at the moment as well. So what were the children's reactions? Well, basically, what was your initial reaction when you were told you would be doing a Minecraft project in school? Write a sentence to describe how you feel. Well, I'll have a quick read of some of them, folks. Right, that seemed to be... It was like, the, it was like what? what? Minecraft in school? You've got to be joking. But they were excited. And on some of the... I wish I could play some of the audio files. Some of them are, are screaming and saying, Yes! Can't believe it! Right, so real kind of excitement by our learners. The fact that this is a project that's going to be part of their school work, so to speak. So a lot of kind of really positives there, folks, right? Then an element of surprise seemed to be common in the feeling from the children. And I was asking them, well, why was this? So I said to them, uh, some of you talked about being surprised that the school was allowing Minecraft to be used in the classroom. And can you tell us to which level you were or were not surprised? So you can see they're very surprised, right? Almost 67% were very surprised. A little surprised, what's that, 28.9. So we're looking at roughly 96% were very surprised, a lot of surprised. So when you ask them, a lot of things come through about how children are kind of like implicitly understanding school. And you can see some of the things, folks, you know. Basically, we don't really expect Minecraft to be used as a learning tool just because initially you think it's just a popular game that has no educational value. So a lot of that's coming through from the children. They're surprised that school thinks this has got any worth or or educational value, they kind of know that it's, they don't associate learning with fun or with play or with exploration. To some extent, that's what seems to be coming through from this, okay? You usually don't play video games in school, okay? Gaming projects not being allowed before. Uh, people were, su were surprised because Minecraft is regarded as a video game. School's just for maths and literacy. A lot of them were saying that kind of thing, okay? Do the children need to be taught how to cooperate, work together? I'm really interested in this because I wrote a post which I'll show you in a second called that Vygotsky played Minecraft. I'm really interested in this paradigm that seems to inform what we do in teacher education as well because we premise a lot of what we do on the zone of proximal development aspect from what Vygotsky talks about. You know, where the learner has got to cross that gap between what they don't know and what they can't do with the help of the, usually the informed adult, i.e. the teacher. And I watch children play, particularly my daughters and their friends over the past three, four years. I watch them. And I watch one on YouTube, on the wiki, and the other one's on the Xbox playing. And none of them is more skilled than the other, but they work together. And they then build these amazing things. The one I remember was they learned how to make a flushing toilet. You know, flushing toilets and, and they had one in every room of their glass and gold palace. And I went and saw it and I thought, right, okay, how did you manage all that without, without me? <laughs> I was my role in this. I've become redundant. So all this stuff's made, been making me think about the way in which young learners are building this almost like innate ability and intrinsic motivation to learn and to develop the strategies that allow them to learn. And I think we need to think about that, folks. So I said to them, this idea of organisation, when you play Minecraft with friends on a shared screen or online through a server, who organises the way you work together? Select one answer from this list. Well, we all discuss and agree to organise ourselves. So 56.7% said that. One person takes the lead and organises everyone. 16.6%. We need an adult to help organise us. Only 3% said it. Now, I know there's a huge culture at the minute with cooperative learning strategies in schools across Dundee and Angus and Highland and XXX. 
And it, it makes you think, you know, are we teaching children to do things they already know to do? Is it just that we're framing things incorrectly? Can we frame learning in a different way that allows those innate abilities to come through? What has your teacher learned about you and your classmates as a result of the Minecraft project? The, the results from the teacher interviews have been really interesting, folks. I'll kind of talk about that at the end. But look at some of these things. I won't read them all to you, folks. I'll be reading some of those. This is what they think the teachers have learned about them. Going at the bottom. I think she's learned that there are a lot of us that are extremely creative and good at planning. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> But they thought, look at me, I'm really good at this. One of the children at school in Dundee, it was a, a girl, she said to me, she couldn't believe that Minecraft came into her classroom, and for the first time in ages, she felt at home in school. So that's one of the things that she said to me, and I've got that documented. I found that, again, really interesting, this idea of I felt at home in school, because, again, this idea of the semiotic domain, situating learning in the worlds that the children know and have mastery over, and the brilliant teacher, the brilliant teacher, the great teachers, know how to exploit these contexts. What's even more interesting than the game uh, is, is developing learning behaviours around it. Do you play Minecraft at home? Almost 81% said they did. Okay, and then I asked them, how do you get good at the game? So a lot of them are using things like YouTube, 22% use YouTube tutorials, 6% uh, using the Minecraft wiki, books, you know the books you get in the book fairs? Apparently they're going, like, everybody's got them, and the teachers got them, and they're really popular. Talk to friends. And exploring the game myself, 23.7%. I think there's a big thing as well about being allowed to get on with things yourself. You know, we, with a social constructivist perspective, where we need to work together. I don't always agree with that. You know, I think it's good to work on your own at times as well. And clearly, quite a lot of the children feel that way too, about how they see themselves as a learner. Okay. YouTube folks, from the Ofcom report last year, st uh, data coming through about the rise of... I, I often think that digital learning uh, via video, it's the rise of this in the way in which young learners are engaging with it. Maybe it's allowing them using technology to go back to the way we always learn, the way we've been hardwired to learn, because we watch each other. And is the written word over the past last few hundred years, is that a mere hiatus in how we learn? You know, is it, is, is it the fact that with video, children are actually going back to this way in which we're actually being, as I say, hardwired to learn? But anyway, just some thoughts that I'm wrestling with. Folks, we had a university showcase day uh, in Dun uh, in, down in Dalhousie, and the schools from Dundee came in, and they were an absolute brilliant credit to themselves, to their teachers, to, to Dundee as well, uh, and it was featured on STV, which if it comes through, I'll have time to show you. Uh, there's my coupon, but never mind that. These are adverts. <laughs> 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 Sorry, folks. Okay. <laughs> Is this Lidl or Aldi? <laughs> I'll give you an extra 30 seconds. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's like it's like I don't know, eh? <laughs> where's, where's my agent? <laughs> give you a top tip. Use an ad blocker. Ad blocker plus. Thank you. I'll take that with me today. So some of it may be like some right children are just playing computer games, but they are in fact learning. As part of a research programme between Dundee University and the Council, pupils from nine schools across the city were asked to come up with their own design for the waterfront to be created using Minecraft. We like the Vene and there's the Discovery. We made a dance hall uh, that was made by Connor Jack and also Sam Adams. We got the Dundee Eye because we know that's a big attraction in London, so we thought it might be a big attraction in Dundee, so we had that. A go karting for also families or for birthday parties. A wildlife centre. The pupils have been working in groups using Xbox and PlayStation 3 consoles that were linked up to smart boards in their classrooms. The idea for the project, which tries to encourage children through interactive learning, came from Dundee University lecturer, Philip Robertson. What they've done is, is amazing. I'm absolutely overjoyed with what we've seen. Not just the Minecraft worlds, but the associated cross-curricular learning and the stories from the teachers and some of the stories I've heard from parents about children's attitudes to learning and their intrinsic motivation to achieve 
when they go to school. I think that's what we're looking for. Unsurprisingly, the Minecraft project has proved hugely popular in the classroom, but it's also helped the children develop a wide range of skills by working together. They have looked at their skills for life, learning and work, and they've been really good with that, linking that to other areas of the curriculum. I think also the benefit of it has been them working together. That's one of the key aspects of it, say, that they've learned to work really well together, communicate with each other, and just share ideas and responsibilities. Minecraft is a global success and is played by children all over the world, but who would have thought it could be used to engage young people to learn more about the area where they live? Dead on. Okay. Okay, folks, so that was that. Now, what did the teachers think? Quite a lot of things, actually. The teachers were fantastic. Uh, Great set of teachers I worked with, randomly selected by the way. There was no sense of any uh, uh, interview process to pick them, so it, was, it basically was a, a, a random, uh, randomly selected sample. They talked about heightened levels of engagement with learning related to the project. They, they talked about kids not wanting to go to playtime, want to come in at dinner time, constantly. Heightened awareness of learners' creativity and digital literacy skills. They couldn't believe what the children knew and could do. They were also reframing their understanding and appreciation of some learners in their class as a result of what they saw they could do in the Minecraft project. Evidence of children displaying the ability to work effectively in a group situation. Again, teachers reported this. They couldn't believe the support the way in which the children worked together in, this, in these spaces. Uh, evidence of children not normally seen as leaders coming to the forefront. They talked about that also. You saw the kids mentioning that. Some shy kids who were normally not some of stood out in class with Minecraft because they were really skilled in it. They became almost uh, really kind of... Uh, the same thing happened with Nintendo dogs, folks, with our top dogs. For those of you from Aberdeenshire who led on that, uh, the top dogs thing seemed to happen as well, where children became natural leaders in a space where they had real agency in it. Role reversal in this regard that challenged the established hierarchies of perceived ability in class. We had a number of kids in class who were at the top of the tree for maths and language and usually always good at everything. For a number of them, because they didn't play Minecraft, it, the, the world changed. They, they were no longer the top dog. And some parents were complaining about this. What's this Minecraft thing? <laughs> and, and the teachers thought it was a great thing for them also. If you look at Dweck's work on growth mindset, I think this is the kind of thing that we're seeing embodied in that. So this kind of role reversal seemed to happen naturally. Issues around the teacher not being in control. Right? Teachers talked about that, but they talked about needing, understanding the need to allow that to, to, to let that go and to, to do the teacher thing which allowed them to question or design. Why have you got that there? <coughs> what, what, is this really going to attract tourists? Uh, what, what, what kind of employment opportunities are going to arise from this? Not really so much the technical aspect of Minecraft, they left that to the learners. And the learners are supportive and skilled teachers. The roles changed. Just about every teacher talked about the fact they became the people and the learners became the teachers. And they talked about how skilled and patient the learners were in teaching them how to do these things. Big, big things for me, I think, in terms of how we change the learning dynamic in the classroom and improve that. Folks, if anybody's seen the Lego movie, you'll understand my metaphor, yeah. right? And I've got the lid on the glue here, because in the movie, present business, as I would suggest, if you look at this video, I don't know if I've, have I got time, Charlie? Yeah. Uh, let's see if this works. I wrote this post called the Vygotsky played Minecraft, and it was embedded in the Lego movie. I went to see it with my daughter and thought it'd be rubbish. And at the end of it, I thought, this is a manifesto for teaching and learning. If anybody's seen that, if you haven't seen the Lego movie, see it, folks. It's wonderful, right? Uh, and it's wonderful if it comes through. Look at this. I work here as well. You think it works for me? <laughs> it's not coming through. At the end of the scene, the, the, the film's all about present business, who's the body character in Lego, and he wants everything to be glued down. So when you make the set in Lego, it's glued down. You can't change it. You follow the instructions, and this is the way it works. But the character, the little builder, he subverts this and they do the most amazing things all through the game and at the end there's a standoff between present business and the character who does all the creative things and it's, it's actually a metaphor for the dad and the son and the, it, it, it cuts to actually real life footage of the dad and the son down in the, in the cellar and it's the dad's cellar and it's all his stuff where he plays his Lego and he never lets his son down there and everything is all about gluing things down and nothing's to be changed but the son goes down and he changes everything he comes up with this wonderful world I think we need to be careful in education that we've got to understand our learners. The landscape's changing. Our children are innately brilliant and creative. We've got to give them the context in which we don't glue things down for them in the classroom so that it will allow them to flourish and to thrive and to reach their potential. And I think that at that, folks, I'm going to call that...
uh, and thank you for your interest. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Any time for questions? Uh, no. no, I'm afraid not.